Centralized Party, yes. Centralism over the party, no. By Honorado Damon. We should first address the issue of centralism, which the programmists have never been able to define in an organic way. Linked as it is to the interpretation of a given historical experience, it simply cannot be reduced to formal and scholastic abstractions. These muddle-headed left communists argue thus. In Lenin's International, there were no pure communist parties, so the use of the democratic mechanism was inextricably linked to what went at that what went to what went at in that particular historical time. Hmm. It is therefore obvious that an international, unlike the third, which consists of pure communist parties, should be identified by a different internal mechanism and not by democratic centralism, which ceased to be operative with the death of Lenin. What happened after that in the Stalinist era is not covered in their analysis because it had nothing to do with the working class and the objectives of the revolution. But to suppose, as the programmists do, an organization in a state of chemical purity, an international of pure communist parties is opposed to that of Lenin, made of impure parties, is playing with a metaphysical paradox. Instead of formulating the problems of a whole series of historical events through the lenses of dialectical materialism, they adopt a formal mechanistic calculation, which tends to get lost in the fog of the most obsolete idealism. We can tell these comrades in all certainty that there will be no international of pure communist parties, but only an, in an international that will reflect within it the good and the evil, the contradictions and absurdity of a society divided into classes, themselves torn by various layers of interest, social conditions, culture, etc. The assumption of communist parties in a pure state with an equally pure world organization, even as a simple aspiration, is not the result of any serious investigation based on Marxism. It strangely resembles a certain mysticism which had its heyday in the 20 years of fascism. Lenin's international certainly had its weaknesses. Due to the immaturity of the historical period that followed the collapse of the Second International and the crisis then afflicting the capitalist world, every proletarian organization reproduces, though in a more advanced way and on an inversely proportional scale, the characteristics of the historical period in which it was formed. And it is certain that the negative aspects present in the Third International will be present, although differently articulated in future international organizations, as amply proved by the objective conditions in which the various left communist groupings, who today claim the right to make a contribution to the reconstruction of the International Proletarian Party, are operating. Amongst these groups, the one that suffers most from intolerance and crises is the Bordigist communist program, where the dynamics of democratic centralism work more deeply as seen in the explosive cycle of its internal contradictions. <clears throat> Today, for polemical convenience, the programmists would like to pass off the Third International as made up of impure parties. But here's how Bordiga previously judged Lenin's International in clear contradiction with the, with the current positions. After restoring proletarian theory, the practical work of the Third International towered over the divisions raised by, by opportunists of all countries in banning from the ranks of the world's vanguard all reformists, social democrats, and centrists, centrists of all types. This renewal took place in all the old parties and is the foundation of the new revolutionary party of the proletariat. Lenin guided with an iron hand the difficult task of dispelling all confusions and weaknesses. The real strength of these Bordigists lies in their inconsistency. How can this group, with its structure of an aristocratic and intellectual elite with a filtered and distilled Marxism, developed in backrooms rather than in the storm of class struggle, contest the accuracy of what we are saying? 
So then, how can we resolve, with Leninist integrity, the debate over the two phases of centralism? In the phase of imperialist domination and proletarian revolution, no organization of the Revolutionary Party can conceivably exist which is not based on a highly centralized structure. Perhaps this is the feature that most dramatically distinguishes it from parliamentary parties. If centralism is therefore an imperative requirement imposed by class conflict, the attributes of democratic and organic define the subjective terms of a polemical distinction that has never affected the substance of this centralization. Who can say with absolute precision how far bodies involved in this centralization make use of the tools of democracy, active participation and active control of the rank and file, and how far the centers of power are based on an authoritarian regime and the physical person of a leader, and through him to the central committee? For the Bordigists of Programma, the problem is posed in terms that come from the counter-revolutionary practice of Stalinism. This is how they tried, finally, to clarify their extraordinary theory that goes under the name of organic centralism. We have reproduced it above in the same words in which it was formulated. But we need to clarify once and for all the relationship that must exist between the center and the base so that the party is structured and operates according to Leninist principles. An ongoing dialectical relationship exists between the members and the party center. It is obviously on the basis of that relationship in the context of theoretical and political platform already agreed that the party leadership develops its tactical action. Lenin never advocated, either in theory or in his political actions, any other way in which the organization could act. And how can we understand the organizational formula of a central committee or of a leader who relies only on himself? on his capacity is related to a set of already planned possible moves. Our emphasis, oh, that's because it was italicized, in relation to no less foreseen outcomes, whilst the so-called membership can usefully be ordered to perform actions indicated by the leadership. It simply means the same as the policy of the Central Committee under Stalin, once all working class elements had been eliminated from the dictatorship of the proletariat. It means a deep and irreparable rupture between the members of the party and its directing center, and the resulting slide into the open reconstruction of capitalism. It also means that the Central Committee of the Russian Communist Party and Stalin himself was tied to a set of possible moves that were perfectly planned in advance, that would be carried out with equal accuracy, in terms and in a reality we all know. What we are denouncing are the disastrous consequences which occur in a supposedly revolutionary party when its central organ, as a body, operates outside of the bounds and control of the organization's memberships or membership. But closer to our experience, we have to denounce precisely those who postulate or allow to be postulated this laughable distinction between a political membership required only to carry out acts indicated by the center and a center that is entrusted with such powers of foresight and divination that it does not offer a very encouraging sight. And here we are dealing with comrades who in terms of preparation and long militancy are highly skilled and command the respect and confidence of the whole party. Was the leadership of the Communist Party of Italy through Bordega's declarations of the common turn, perhaps not bound to a set of possible options that deny the possibility of fascism's rise to power at the very time when it was carrying out the march on Rome? And was this glaring error of perspective not in correspondence with the no less foreseeable outcome of jeopardizing the party with the tactic of the offensive for the offensive sake? And who prepared a scientific analysis of the Russian economy defining the October Revolution as anti-feudal revolution after having celebrated it as a socialist? Had Bordega not affirmed in Lenin nel Camino de la Revolución, <laughs> the revolution will be made in Russia by and for the working class itself. And further, Soviet power was victorious. The, the dictatorship of proletariat predicted by Marx made its tremendous entrance onto the stage of history. How should we judge someone who was the most prominent exponent of the party and of left-wing communism who refused to become a militant in the Internationalist Communist Party 
at the time of its formation, as he considered it a mistake to fight directly against the National Communist Party, with the excuse that the workers were in the party of Togliotti. Then, when our split occurred, agreed to enter the PCDI, provided that the rump remained true to him, politically neutered and reduced to a sect of repeaters of not always digested formulae. What was his contribution to the development of a critical examination of the nature of the Second World War and the role played by Russia as a major imperialist player when he rejected our definition of state capitalism to speculate about Russia as a spurious form of industrial state? The questions could continue, but we have said enough to show how ill-founded, precarious, and objectively dangerous is his claim to assign to the Central Committee and this or that person, whatever their esteem or skills of divination, the tasks of arbitrarily developing our theory and functions of leadership outside of and above the party as a whole. Lenin, at his most personal and most decisive, by which we mean the Lenin of the April Theses, had a desperate determination to go to the sailors beyond the formal organization of the Bolshevik Party's Central Committee, whose positions which were which the which were based on misunderstanding and compromise. Lenin was not operating on organic or even democratic centralism here, but acting as the chief pillar of the coming revolution, the only one who had understood and endorsed the demands of the working class, and this is because his feet were firmly on a class terrain, because he thought and worked in class terms and for the class, and had a very lively sense of history which teaches us that revolution loves action and hates cowards who turn up a day late. In this constant dialectical relationship between the membership and leadership of the party, in this necessary integration of freedom and authority, lies the solution of a problem to which professional objectors have perhaps paid too much attention. Any revolutionary party, which is not a mere abstraction, has to address the problems of the class struggle in a historical climate in which violence and unchallenged authority dominates. In order to increasingly become a living instrument of combat, it can only be organized around the most iron unity. Its ranks, therefore, have to be closed against the general thrust of the counter-revolution. The Revolutionary Party does not ape bourgeois parties, but obeys the need to adapt its organizational structure to the objective conditions of the revolutionary struggle. The elementary tactical principle of the Revolutionary Party in action is that it must take into account the characteristics of the terrain on which it works and that its members are adequately prepared for their tasks. We do not believe there needs to be disagreements on the question of centralism. These only begin when we talk in democratic or organic terms. The use, or worse, the abuse of the term organic can lead to forms of authoritarian degeneration which break the dialectical relationship that must exist between the leadership and the members. The experience of Lenin is still valid, and it is vital to be able to fuse together in a single vision the seeming contradiction between democratic and organic centralism.